Amen. Hope you're ready to go see Jesus. Hope you've trusted Christ as your Savior. I'm sure glad you're here this morning. Have your Bibles open to Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter number 5. Thanks for being here today, for coming to church. You glad you're in church? Well, I've already been touched this morning. I've already been encouraged this morning. Just seeing your smiling faces. Glad you're here. Thankful for you being here. Great to see some folks with us. I saw Lance Corporal Gibbs. Did I get that right? Okay, I got a thumbs up. So I'm going to pull this enough. Uh, Brother Philip Gibbs, of course, went to school here, and he's here back and serving in uh, North Carolina. North Carolina here this morning. I think Mom's happy to have one of her sons home. They're great here. But Philip, glad you're here today, my friend. Many of the visitors here, thanks for being here this morning. We're going to look at thankfulness today. It's a week of Thanksgiving. So how can I help but look at thankfulness from the Bible, from God's Word? Thankfulness is a mark of a Christian. Or thankfulness is a mark of a right Christian. Because there are some Christians who just plain aren't thankful. Can I get an amen? amen? I've met some sour Christians, have you? Now don't look around, don't point, especially not to your spouse who will be walking home today. You've met these people who aren't thankful, haven't you? Boy, and when they say thank you, it's always with an edge. You know, you can say thank you and not mean thank you. Thanks a lot. I said thank you. I really meant it too. Oh, wow. I'm so thankful for what you got me. That's, that's tremendous. The Bible teaches us that we ought to be thankful. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. We'll start at the last verse that we'll look at, and then we'll kind of backtrack on what we're doing this morning. In Ephesians chapter number 5, look with me, please, in verse number 20. I want us to see the parameters. I want us to see the, the stipulation. I want us to see, if I can, the bar that is being set for Christians. And it's not a low goal. It's not a low bar. It's a lofty one. It's one that is only possible with the power of God in your life. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 20, where the Bible says, giving thanks. Now, we'll pause right there because that's where some people just stop. They think if they got that part down, boy, then they nailed Thanksgiving. And they'll come to Thursday morning and they'll have the turkey and they'll take some time to, to give thanks. And they forget that there's a whole lot more to the verse. They think, well, those first two words, that's all that's important in my life as a Christian. Now, that is important. We'll talk about that, how to be verbal and outward in our thanks. But that's not all that's important, not according to the Bible. We're supposed to give thanks. And I hope this morning, I pray this morning, that you are a thankful person. Helen Keller, she was blind. She said this, so much has been given to me that I'd have no time to ponder that which I don't have. We have a lot of time to ponder that which we don't have. Why didn't this happen? Why didn't I get this? Why did this turn out this way? Someone else said this, giving thanks is, a matter, is not a matter of feeling thankful, but a matter of obedience. The person who said that was a quadriplegic. Boy, I don't have everything in the world, but I can walk. All right, I can move, I can stand up and sit down of my own volition and my own strength. I don't have to be helped up or helped down. And someone who can't walk says it's not a matter of feeling but a matter of obedience. Someone else pointed out that the pilgrims, that they made seven times more graves than they did huts, yet set aside a day for Thanksgiving. Someone else said this, gratitude is an offering precious in the sight of our God. It is one that the poorest of us can offer, and we're not poor having made it, but richer. Thankfulness this morning, and sometimes people stop after those first two words, giving thanks. Well, I got that, Pastor. I'm thankful. But the Bible goes on to say this, giving thanks always. Boy, that's a terrible word to follow those other two words. Giving thanks always. But he doesn't stop there. I wish he had. Giving thanks always, the next two words, help me if you've got your old Bibles open. Giving thanks always, what are the next two words, or next three words? For all things. Really, Lord? That's what you're calling us to? 
That's what you're going to ask of us to not only give thanks and not only be thankful, and we ought to be thankful. We'll talk about that this morning. But be thankful always. Lord, you mean Monday mornings? When it's cold out? Six feet of snow? And I have to walk uphill to school both ways while wearing a mask? Always, Lord? Always? You mean when my husband is a, is a big jerk to me, I'm still supposed to be thankful always? That's what it says. You mean when I'm mistreated at work, and when, when my boss falsely accuses me of something? Give thanks always? Yes, my child, give thanks always for all things. All right, Lord, let me sit down for a moment. Let me kind of process what you're telling me. Because, Lord, what you're telling me and what I feel are two different things. And often in our life, what we know to be true and right and what we feel and, unfortunately, what we do are two different things. This morning, I want to talk about thankfulness, the mark of a Christian, the right mark of a right Christian. Well, we ought to be all marked up. Lord, help us this morning as we look at your word. Lord, we need your help Lord, we are truly grateful to you to be here today. Lord, thank you for the time we have to look at your word, the freedom here in America, to be able to hold this assembly with liberty. Lord, thank you for Jesus and his gift on the cross. Lord, we thank you for so many things. And Lord, help us today to listen to your spirit through your word. Lord, if there's an area where we've been resistant to you or not been obedient to you, Lord, would you touch us today? Help us to change, to be more like your son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. In this passage that we're going to look at this morning, it kind of ends at verse number 20, the one we looked at this morning, giving thanks always for all things. It is a mind, a potentially mind-numbing command. There are a few of those in Scripture. For instance, one that says, love your enemies. I can love those who love me. I can love those who tolerate me. I can even love those who are annoyed at me. But love my enemies? Them which want to, the Bible says, despitefully use you and persecute you. And the Bible says you're supposed to love them. And go beyond that, pray for them. That is a mind-numbing command. Lord, this is, this is just, Wow. I can't do it. I would say this is another one such command where the Bible says, give thanks always for all things. You see, there are some things that are easy to be thankful for. You may receive a Christmas bonus this year. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I like that Christmas bonus, right? Praise the Lord for that. You get the call from the mechanic Boy, we thought you needed a new engine. It was going to be $2,000, but actually it was just a little oil plug right here to cost you $3.35. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Some of you men are thankful because you got some deer out there. I hear, Bill, you got a deer, a couple deer, right? Oh, a couple of them, Bill. Did you get a couple? Three. Three. Oh, man, going to Bill's house for venison. It's easy when the deer lines up perfectly and you men don't miss that shot to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Other times are easy when you're doing something and you see something that could have gone horribly wrong and it didn't. And you see the hand of God. You're cutting down a tree and it misses the house barely. A few years back, we had a, about a well, 40 or 50 foot gumball tree. They're called gumball trees at our, at our former house. And uh, again, these little sticky things, they were everywhere. I looked up online how to get rid of them, and the options were inject the tree every year or cut it down. Well, that was an easy solution. I'm cutting it down. It was right by the corner of the house, maybe within about 10 feet of the house, and it was all oh, 40, maybe even 60 feet. It was a huge, huge tree. As we were cutting it down in my backyard, we stopped partly, partly and realized that it was going to fall on the back of the house. Well, we adjusted the straps. When it finally fell, hit just the corner of the porch. It would have flattened. It would have flattened the back of my house. Can you imagine that insurance company call? A tree fell on my house. <laughs> but what was happening right before that? I don't know. I couldn't hear over the sound of the chainsaws. <laughs> you know. 
At that time, you're like this. Whoo, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. There are times that it's easy, it seems, to be thankful. Thanksgiving, thank you, Lord. Thank you for what, for what you've done. But there are equally as true times that it's not so easy to be thankful. Hey, we thought it was going to be a drain plug in your car, but you need a new engine. Thank you, Lord. We thought we were going to give you a Christmas bonus, but instead you got a consumer's bill. Twice as much as you expected. Because one of your kids left the lights on. Thank you, Lord. And thank you for my kids. When the tree, which is not near the house, somehow falls on the house. Thank you, Lord. This verse challenges us in a way that is unnatural in our flesh, in our humanity. In our humanity, it's easy to say thank you when it's good and to kind of survive or grumble through the times that are not so good, through the times that the turkey is burnt. Remember the first time that we cooked, we cooked a turkey. Not so good at the Howell House. We ended up opening the doors, airing out the house, we went down to the bowling alley for two hours so we could be back in the house. You know, we, we cooked it a brand new way. That year we used one of those bags. All right, if you use a bag, then shame on you. Shame on you. You can cook at Cracker Barrel and cook other places. It's, we used one of those bags, and the corner of the bag leaked, and it leaked all over the bottom of the oven. And uh, apparently that causes smoke and black smoke in your house. Thank the Lord for smoke alarms. They let you know when the turkey's done. It's tremendous. <laughs> It's a blessing. See, you can always be thankful for all things and everything. All right, give thanks. Thank you. Lord, thank you that I got the flat tire. I always want a flat tire in the middle of January when I forgot my gloves. See, there are times that it seems to be easy and times that it seems to be difficult, but the reality is, the truth is, that as a Christian, an attribute of a Christian walking with God is abounding gratitude. One attribute of a Christian who is walking with God is abounding gratitude. In this passage, we'll look back a few verses, look in verse number 15, kind of where the passage begins, where the Bible challenges us as Christians this way, see then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. You see, as Christians, first of all, we have a purpose. God has provided us a purpose in our life. We don't have to live a life with a half-hearted, empty, vain, meaningless endeavor, but we have a purpose in Christ we have a purpose in our Savior. The Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. And the context for verse number 20, to give thanks, begins with my walk with God. Out of a correct walk with God flows thankfulness. Because just in me, just in my own ability, I can't do it. It won't always make sense to me. And I won't always be thankful. I'll like to pick and choose. Lord, I'll take this blessing and this bonus and this answer to prayer and this thing, and I'll skip one, two, and three. And the passage begins to make sure that we walk circumspectly or purposefully. You ought not to, as a Christian, walk meaningless in life or just as it happens. Now, there has to be a commitment and faith in the Lord that whatever happens, whatever the Lord brings is good. But I don't wake up saying, hey, it is what it is. Remember, I hate that phrase. One couple from this church bought me one of the signs that says it is what it is, and it's in my office. I've been asked why it's in there is to remind me that there's at least one couple in the church that annoys me. <laughs> No, they were joking. And phrase is always negative. That's why I don't like it. It is what it is. I will say it sometimes. And the church, if you're on a church member, they'll say, oh, you said it, Pastor. It's always negative. We never say, wow, I got a $100,000 gift. It is what it is. <laughs> wow, the report came back from the doctor, and uh, I'm completely clear of, of this disease. It is what it is. No, no, we say this. Huh, you know what? They're also out of toilet paper. It is what it is. Oh, man, I lost my power for six hours. 
It is what it is. It's always used in a negative sense. Now, some of you smart Alex out there will now try to use it as a positive phrase. Well, then praise the Lord. I'll let you. I'll let you. But our life as a Christian is supposed to be purposeful. See that you walk circumspectly. That means when you wake up in the morning, make sure you're on the right path, that you're on the right purpose, and that purpose is from God Almighty. See then that you walk circumspectly. We don't need Christians just to be endeavoring whatever they want to do, whatever happens, but to live for Jesus Christ. There's a purpose in, in the Savior. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. He is a new crea creation. All things have passed away, and all things have become new. There's a purpose in the Savior. There's a purpose for the Savior. The Bible says in Colossians, another passage that Paul wrote, that Jesus Christ in all things ought to have the preeminence, is the, the word the Bible uses. And what that means is that in all things, Jesus Christ ought to be number one. He ought to be the top of every single list you have, the top of your list, a to-do list for the day, your top of your list for finances, your top of your list for needs, for help. He ought to be the top of your list that in all things... He ought to have, he needs to be, he must be first place. You see, if we expect to have a heart of gratitude, giving thanks always for all things, it has to begin with Jesus Christ. I can't do it myself, you can't do it yourself. It has to begin with salvation. I was six years old as a young person in Sunday school class or junior church when I realized that I was a sinner, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for me, and that by trusting him, he would save me and promise me a home in heaven. And at six years old, I asked Jesus to save me. I prayed a simple prayer. I don't remember exactly what I prayed, and that wasn't important. What was important was that I believed in Jesus Christ. I believed in his sacrifice on the cross, and by trusting him, he became my Savior. But that doesn't mean that he's always number one in J.D.'s Howell's life. You know who normally is number one in my life? Doreen, of course. Of course, my wife is always number one. Anything she wants, I will do. No, it's not who's normally number one. It's not Johnny, it's not James, it's not even Danielle, little baby girl. It's me. It's me. If I'm going to be honest, who's normally number one or who's going to take the place of Jesus more than anybody else, it's going to be me. That's who I fight with, wanting to be number one. My own thoughts, my own reactions, my own perspective. Boy, we think we're right, we think we're correct, and we knock off too often Jesus Christ from being number one. See, the, the passage starts with this thankfulness ending. It begins with a purpose. See that we walk circumspectly. And, and we come all the way back to verse number 1 of Ephesians chapter 5. It, but be either followers of God. That's our purpose. That's our direction. It's a purpose for the Savior. But then he gives us a perception in this passage. Verse number, verse number 17 Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. My time as principal, I would often meet with the young people and would have a question that would reoccur throughout my time in the school with the teenagers. How do I know God's will? How do I know what God wants? Sometimes it was around the fact of, of going to a certain college. And they say, Pastor J.D., I don't, I don't want to miss what God has. How do I know the will of God? And I'd give them some principles from God's Word, but here the Bible gives us something that is the will of God. Here's a passage that as we follow it out now, we look at the next couple verses, it's going to tell us what the will of God is. So we can't say, I didn't know. I didn't know. Lord, I didn't hear you. A popular response at the Howell House clean your room. What? I didn't hear that. I didn't know. <laughs> How could you not know, young person, whose time on earth is rapidly growing to an end? <laughs> but adults, we do know better. We do know better. 
We do it with the Lord. Oh, I didn't know that. Sometimes we don't care to know. We willingly shove our fingers in our spiritual ears and say, I don't want to hear that. I don't have to worry about that because if I don't know it, I'm not responsible for it. I'll tell you, my friend, we are responsible for it. Don't miss it this morning. The Bible's going to tell us what the will of the Lord is. There's a perception. It is possible to know what God has for us. He hasn't made this a mystery for us. He hasn't tried to make it too complicated right here. He hasn't even tried to hide it from us. He can show us exactly, he'll show us exactly what the will of the Lord is in this passage. See, there's a purpose. There's a perception. And then there's some power, verse number 18, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. That concept, that idea there is that I'm supposed to be controlled by the Spirit. Another passage uses I'm supposed to walk in the Spirit. Or every step of my life, I'm supposed to let someone else be in charge. We have an easier time letting Google Maps direct us than the Holy Spirit. There are the stories that early on when GPS was just not as good as it is now, when Apple Maps first hit the scene, and that was just a mistake on every level apparently, that you'd hear these stories of of people ending up in random locations in the middle of a desert or almost turn into a lake or go across a bridge that's not there. Now as a a young person, or I'm not real young, but younger than some of you, of course, supposed to say thank you, giving thanks always for all things. I have not used a map in years. Some of you older Christians will just shake your head. What a shame. The lost art of looking at a map. It's not a lost art. That's like saying bloodletting is a lost art. No, we have advanced. All right, I don't have to know where to go. I just have to ask Google. Google, how do I get to my fridge? Oh, and it knows. Maybe you found yourself, and, and let me just ask, how many people use the map function on your phone, your smartphone, GPS? Come on, put them up there real high. All right, all right many of you. Maybe your experience is like mine. I type it in, put it there, and then I'm mindless. Turn left. Boom. You know, I don't even know where left I'm just like left, turn right. And I, the other day I was using one that didn't quite give me a heads up on life. You know, it was like the instant turns. Now they give you like in a half a mile, in 13 feet, in 14 seconds. But I was using an older one the other day, and it was like all of a sudden like, turn right. I'm like, "Ah!" you know. I'm like, man, this old technology, it's terrible. (laughs) If Google Maps told me to go somewhere, I'm following it. We could learn a lot about walking in the Spirit from Google Maps. Where I'm like, Lord... I punch in the direction. See that you walk circumspectly. Lord, the direction is to please you. Lord, I punch in the direction. I hit go, and I wait for you to tell me what to do. All right, J.D., take a left. All right, Lord, taking a left. Back up. When you see the first time, turn around. Have you heard that message before from your GPS? Have you heard it from the Holy Spirit before? Listen, you're going down a wrong path. Turn around. At the nearest spot can be turn around. Turn around now. And yet we listen better to Google Maps than we do the Holy Spirit. It says turn around on our GPS, and we're flipping that car around in the middle of four-lane traffic, pulling a Huey. Car is honking and screeching around. Your wife gripping the front seat. Kids are praying to the Lord in the back seat. And all we know is the GPS said turn around. The Holy Spirit, though, will tell us to turn around over and over and over again. And we say, well, I know how to get there better than you. We say, I can still please the Lord. I can still walk to the purpose and not listen to the Holy Spirit. And you can't. You can't. You see, we end up in this passage on giving thanks, but the process to get there is a different process than just sitting down and writing a thankful list. And that's good and that's helpful and you ought to do that sometimes. But it's a different process. I'm not talking about just some earthly things. I'm talking about a spiritual thankfulness. There's some power that's available that we have access to once we're Christian. We ought to punch in that direction, please the Lord, hit go, and just follow him. Now the passage says this, this I say then, walk 
in the Spirit. It's interesting that the Bible does not say run in the Spirit, jog in the Spirit, or sprint in the Spirit. It could have used all those words, but it used the word walk with the idea that it's a step by step by step by step by step by step process. I know the final place, heaven. I know the destination pleased the Lord, the purpose. But the process to get there with God will require me to take one step at a time. And all I know usually is just one more step. You know, the Bible often tells us the same thing in different ways. The beauty of, of God's Word being supernatural all works together like this. Psalm 119 says this, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Those little lamps, they would, would just tie to their feet so they could see just one more step in front of them. You know why I can be thankful? One reason I can be thankful always for all things? Because I know as I follow God and walk in the Spirit, this is just one more step. We're not thankful. We, we, have, uh, we have discontentment. We don't have gratitude because we see the step that we're in right then and we think, this looks like a mess. If I can, I have a small dog, three and a half pounds. And even then he goes out to use the restroom in the backyard. Even then I can manage to find what he puts out there. <laughs> Sometimes in life you step in something. How is God going to use this for good? This is a mess. This situation in life is smelly. Nothing good that I can see. Nothing good that, that anything in my life, I, there's no perception or anything good. Yet God says, you can trust me. And if we walk in the Spirit, step by step by step, in His power, Understanding this is the will of the Lord, we could end up in verse number 20. You see, with walking in the Spirit, you either are doing it or you're not. You're either following Him or you're not. There is not a third option. It's either His way or another way. It's either His reactions or it's other reactions. It's either his plan or another, th another plan. It's either his power or some other power. It's either his thoughts or, or my thoughts. See, some Christians are like wheelbarrows. They must be pushed. Some are like canoes. They need a good paddling. Some are like kites. They need to be kept on a string. Some are like footballs. You can't tell where they'll bounce to next. Some are like balloons, full of hot air. Some are like trailers, they must be pulled. Some are like lights, off and on and off and on. Some are like kittens, they're all happy when you pet them. But some are like a fully charged battery, dependable, loyal, there when you need it, ready to assist you because of a power, a deep power within. You see, if we're going to have verse number 20, we've got to walk with a purpose. We have to know what the will of God is. We have to have his power. And lastly, I see the praise. Kind of finishing with where we began, the praise. Verse 19 says that we can speak to ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's an external praise. That's the singing and the speaking. I ought to talk. I ought to sing about what God has done. I love the songs we sing here at First Baptist Church to talk about what God has done. I think of this one, O Lord my God, when I'm in awesome wonder, consider all the world's Thy hands have made. I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder. And thy power throughout the universe displayed. Great is thy faithfulness. O oh God, my Father, there is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest 
not. Thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died, my richest gain, I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. External praise. A lot of things in this life we claim to be a richest gain. Promotion, an item, house, vehicle, 401k, stock market, retirement, a deal. So many things we count as a rich gain. And yet, I count them but loss when I look at my Savior. There ought to be some praise on your lips. I hope when you come to church, you come with an attitude of praise to your God. And if you're here, you never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. You can trust Him today. He can be your Father. He can be your God. He wants to be your Savior. There's an external thing. But it's also internal, and that's verse number 20. I'm going to close with this right here real quick. Kind of built the scenario. We have to walk with a purpose and have the perception of the will of God and have the power now and the praise externally. But internally, the Bible says, giving thanks always, there's a confirmation. You know that when you give thanks, it's confirming something? Someone does something kind, you say, thank you. I confirm that what you did, I appreciate. When was the last time you confirmed with God that what he did was good to you? Lord, thank you. Lord, thank you for this. Lord, thank you for bringing this. Lord, thank you for this blessing. Lord, thank you. In a confirmation, you acknowledge something. I read about when Jesus did that. He's at the tomb of Lazarus. He is about to bring Lazarus forth from the dead, and he prays this way. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. But then he goes on, and I know that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may, they may believe that thou hast sent me. What Jesus said is, Lord, thank you for hearing me. And I know you always hear me, but I said that so everyone else could hear it. Sometimes we're supposed to give thanks so everyone else can hear it. Confirm it. Lord, thank you. The folks around you know that you confirm what God has done is good. Do your coworkers know that as a Christian who walks with God, what God does is good, that who God is is good, that you're thankful, or do they think you're just like everybody else? When it's good, you say thanks. When it's bad, you grumble and complain. Mark of a Christian who's right with God. There's a confirmation. There's a continuing, always. Make sure this week is not the only week that you give thanks to God. No, pastor, that's not true. Every time I eat, I give thanks. Oh, come on. You ought to give thanks when you pray when you, before a meal. I, I'm all for that. Jesus did that before he broke the bread when he, when he broke the bread to feed the 5,000. He did that. You ought to. But don't say for a moment that that's, that's your thankfulness to God so you can eat. There's so many things God has blessed us with. Continue and give thanks always. For all things, the last word today, contentment. That's what it's about. I'm content. I have to be content. We give thanks for the good things, thanks for the problems that have been resolved, for the situations that have come out just right, for the solutions that we needed. For those who are sick and are now better, but he challenges us to give thanks for all things. Gulp. A man became envious of his friends because they had a larger house and more luxurious home than he had. So this man listed his home with a real estate firm. He was planning to sell it and then buy a better one. 
Shortly after listing it, he came across an advertisement for a house that it was absolutely perfect. It was the place he wanted to be. It was the property size that he wanted. It was all the features that he wanted in the house. So he quickly called his real estate agent and said, listen, a house that I'm looking for, it just hit today's paper. That's the house I want. Go buy it for me. The agent said, well, listen, let me ask you about it. As he began to ask, the real estate agent said, well, sir, that's the exact house that you're selling. You see, the life that I really want, full of peace and joy, is the life that God promises to me if I walk with him. That's why I can have contentment. Thankfulness is a mark of a Christian who is walking with God, appreciation for what God allows and brings into my life. There was a man who was once content and cheerful. He was content and cheerful through a very long trial. One of his friends asked him what was the secret to his contentment. He said, I will tell you, I made right use of my eyes. Well, his friend said, well, please explain. What do you mean by right use of your eyes? He said, well, first, I look up to heaven. I remember that my principal business is to get there. Then I look down upon this small earth and I think about what a small place I shall occupy when I'm dead and buried. Then I look around and see all those who are, in all respects, worse off than I am. Then I look in the Scripture and find out where true happiness lies, where all the cares in, and how little reason I have to complain. Giving thanks, that's the easy part. Always, for all things, only possible with God's help. Lord, I ask you to help us today to be truly thankful as a Christian ought to be. Lord, help us to see the power that you so freely offer to us through your Son, Jesus Christ, and your Spirit. Lord, may we be content for everything that you do in our life. Lord, may we give thanks to know that you're in control. What if you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, as you spoke, God spoke to me. I've found myself being thankful for the good things, but not so much for the bad things. I wouldn't be content. Pastor, would you pray for me? As you spoke, God spoke to me. I I want to be that thankful Christian with the help of God. Would you pray for me this morning when you pray? Amen. Amen. Hands all over. Amen. 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 I wonder if you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, you talked about trusting Jesus Christ as my Savior. I've never done that before. You talked about that. I'd like to know about that. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? Now, I'll draw no more attention to you than did anyone else. My friend, if you don't know that you're on your way to heaven, we'd love to open a Bible and show you how you can know for sure. How God loves you, Jesus died for you. He would say, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? Would you slip your hand up to the back down? We'll see it. And... Anyone here? Amen, I see that. Who else? Who else? Lord, bless this invitation. Lord, you know those who have raised their hand, acknowledge that they need to look to you for gratitude and thankfulness. Lord, you've worked in their heart. May they follow you in obedience, Lord. And those who don't know you as your Savior, Lord, would they be able to learn today how they can put their trust in you? Lord, would they trust you today as their Savior? In Jesus' name, amen.